Hello, everyone, and welcome to WEO's Colorectal Cancer Screening Committee's third expert working group webinar. This webinar is hosted by groups Right Sided Lesions, Interval Cancers, and Surveillance After Colorectal Neoplasia. Without much further ado, I would like to hand over to Global Chair Evelyn Decker. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Uh, again, uh, not only for the introduction today, but also for your um, great organization of, um, of all those meetings. So I'm very happy to, uh, to welcome you again, indeed, the third um, webinar of um, the expert working groups. Um, as I already said last time, I'm really excited myself to uh, be able to join every uh, uh, expert working group um, this time, instead of trying to run around and, um, and join everyone a little bit. Uh, this feels much better to me. It means we have a weekly program to offer, which um, I think is, uh, is, is quite nice. And, um, and we are working uh, towards our plenary meeting, which we are, have nearly uh, finalized now, which will be um, communicated with um, the, the whole of the membership sh uh, shortly. And as you will know, the plenary um, uh, meeting will be in, uh, on May uh, 20th. So I would like to uh, hand over now to the first two chairs of today, which are the chairs of the Right Sided and Interval uh, Cancer uh, uh, Expert Working Groups. It's um, uh, my pleasure, um, Matthew Rutter and uh, Jeff Lee. And then later we will move to the Surveillance Working Group to uh, Rodrigo Hover and uh, Uri Ladebaum. So thank you very much for um, all your work, all the chairs and the speakers. And um, please, Jeff, go ahead. Well, hello, everyone. And Welcome to another exciting WO uh, Colorectal Cancer Screening Committee meeting webinar. Uh, my name is Jeff Lee, um, and I'm a co-chair for the Interval Cancer or PCCRC Working Group. Uh, joining me for the session will be uh, 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 Dr. Matt Rutter, who's also the co-chair of the Interval Cancer Working Group, Dr. Rodrigo Hover, and uh, Dr. Yuri Laudobam, both of which are uh, co-chairs for the Surveillance After Colorectal Cancer uh, or um, Colorectal Neoplasia Working Group. Um, we're thrilled uh, to be able to moderate today's webinar. Uh, before we start, I would like to go over some few housekeeping rules. So first, the Zoom chat function and raise the hand function are turned off. Um, so instead, please post your questions via the Q&A uh, box. Uh, Matt and I will be addressing your questions uh, during the webinar. And lastly, if you'd like to um, speak or participate in the discussion afterwards, we can promote you uh, as a panelist. We have an exciting agenda today uh, from the Interval Cancer Working Group and the uh, Surveillance After uh, Colorectal Neoplasia Working Group. We have three outstanding uh, speakers who present in their, their recent work in this field. Um, the first talk will be uh, presented by Dr. Han Mo Chu uh, from Taiwan, which is titled, Is There a Role of an Interval Fit for the Prevention of PCCRC? The second talk uh, will be presented by Dr. Anna's uh, Drs. Anna Forsberg and Dr. Um, Fahima Dosa, uh, which is titled, Are PCCRCs More Lethal Compared to uh, Detected Colorectal Cancers? And we'll have expert views from Sweden and from Canada. Uh, lastly, um, we'll have another discussion uh, focused on surveillance after colorectal neoplasia. Uh, um, and this will be led by Dr. Yuri Laudabam and Dr. Rodrigo Hover, and they'll be introducing the speakers at that time. And so we'll have uh, many uh, points to discuss following Dr. Laudabom's talk. Uh, here are some of the questions that we'll be addressing. Uh, so please keep that in mind uh, afterwards uh, while during this talk so that we can have a, uh, a jam-packed session um, and exciting opportunity to be able to um, uh, speak about this talk. And so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our first speaker. I'll hand the, uh, well, to introduce our first speaker, I'm gonna hand the mic to Dr. Matt Rutter. Thanks, Jeff, and hello, everybody. Uh, so it's my um, pleasure to be able to introduce our first uh, speaker, uh, Professor Han Mo Chu uh, from uh, the National Taiwanese uh, University. Uh, one of the uh, 
advantages of, of, of these webinars is that we can have an international audience. Uh, one of the disadvantages is that everyone's working from a different time zone. So I, I think it's uh, just past midnight in, in Taiwan. So thank you, Hanmo, for, for, for staying up late uh, this evening. Uh, so uh, Hanmo is the principal investigator of the Taiwan Colorectal Cancer uh, Screening Program and also one of the co-authors of WEO's uh, guidelines for PCCRC. So it's a, uh, an excellent uh, um, opportunity to introduce our first speaker and uh, you're the, absolutely the right person to uh, uh, ask the question and answer the question perhaps, uh, is there a role for interval fit for the prevention of PCCRC? Hanmo, over to you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the very kind introduction. So uh, very nice to see you all. Uh, today, my talk will be uh, going to talk about is there a law of an interval fit for the prevention of PCCRC? I'm Dr. Han Mo Chu from National Taiwan University. So the reason why we use fit as the primary screen modality is that it can specifically select people at higher risk of colorectal cancer from a large population, thereby reducing the demand of colonoscopy. And this is supported by the observation in the fit based Taiwanese colorectal cancer screening program. The odds of having advanced adenoma and colorectal cancer were fourfold and 24 respectively compared with the general population. Similarly, a recent study by, uh, by the Asia Pacific Working Group on Colorectal Cancer revealed that fit positive colonoscopy cohort had overall 1.4 time risk of having a neoplasm, 4.5 time risk of having advanced adenoma, and 1.28 times of having synchronous adenoma compared with the direct screening colonoscopy cohort indicating that fit positive subjects are actually a very high risk population for having or developing colorectal cancer. And our recent study comparing the histology of the lesion detected by direct screening colonoscopy and the fit positive colonoscopy revealed that 85 of the adenoma detected in screening colonoscopy cohort were less than 10 millimeter and that there were neither carcinoma in situ nor invasive cancer within this size category. In contrast, the neoplasm that detected at colonoscopy in fit positive subject were much larger in size with 30% of them larger than 10 millimeter. And there were carcinoma in situ and T1 cancers even at a size less than 10 millimeter. So if we are missing polyp at colonoscopy with the same mechanical mechanism, then we wonder whether we have missed more polyp or more high risk lesion like the depressed type lesion or small T1 cancer at fit positive colonoscopy. So our subject with negative colonoscopy in the fit program equivalent to that in the screening colonoscopy setting. In direct, uh, direct screening colonoscopy, we recommend a 10 year surveillance interval after a negative exam. Is it justified to follow up those with positive fit and negative colonoscopy in the same way with the 10 year surveillance interval? In fact, it is largely unknown to what extent that the risk of colorectal cancer is reduced in the fit positive subject after a colonoscopy. So the question are, should we arrange colonoscopy within this 10 year period? If yes, this means shortening of the surveillance interval? Or should we provide any surveillance tests? If yes, then we should ask what tool should be used and at what timing, who can be most benefit from such a test? In our fit screening program, currently there is no strict guideline for those who have a negative colonoscopy. Some people receive fit screening after a negative colonoscopy where some people just undergo surveillance colonoscopy years later. Therefore, the aim of our study is to compare the risk of incident colorectal cancer in subjects who did and did not receive interval fit after a negative colonoscopy. So we conducted a retrospective analysis of the screening database of Taiwanese program. 
And uh, this program offered by any office screening for those age 50 to 69 during 2004 to 2013, and those age 50 to 74 since 2013, and the link uh, the database to the nationwide cancer registry database. In the current study, we included subjects who had a positive fit at their first screening with negative finding at diagnostic colonoscopy after excluding those with incomplete colonoscopy during the period of 2004 to 2009. And this study cohort was follow up until the end of 2014, no matter whether the age of the study subject had already exceeded the upper age limit of our program. Of those who had a positive fit, there were totally 9,179 subjects who had negative colonoscopy finding. 6,195 of them received fit screening in the subsequent years with different interval. And here are the number of the instant corrective cancer <coughs> that developed in those who did not receive fit screening and those who received uh, fit screening at a different interval. The instance of colorectal cancer was expressed at the event per 1,000 person years. The instance was 1.34 per 1,000 person year in those who received interval fit and the 2.69 per 1,000 person year in those who didn't. The instance of colorectal cancer in subjects who underwent interval fit at different timing are also demonstrated here. And this slide shows the distribution of the stages of incident colorectal cancer in those who did and did not receive interval fit. We can see that the majority of colorectal cancer developed in those who did not receive interval fit were more advanced in stage, which was a strong contrast with that in the interval fit group in which more than half of the colorectal cancer were early stage one and many of them were screen detected. The result of multivariate analysis revealed that the, those who underwent interval fit had a significantly lower risk of developing incident colorectal cancer. In addition, the ADR of the endoscopy unit where the subject underwent baseline colonoscopy were inversely associated with the uh, risk of uh, incident colorectal cancer and the higher baseline quantitative measurement of the fit, the fecal hemoglobin concentration was associated with increased risks. And uh, this slide showed the occurrence of colorectal cancer along with time. More incident colorectal cancer were diagnosed within the initial three years after the negative colonoscopy. If we stratify with interval fit, then such a trend became more evident, meaning that not only the colorectal cancer in the interval fit group be detected at early stage by fit screening, but many of the cancer were possibly avoided by the detection of advanced adenoma. So in conclusion, fit can be used as a surveillance tool to effectively reduce the risk of incident corrective cancer in a fit screening program. And it would be most effective if it is provided within three years after colonoscopy which is inconsistent with the estimated mean shorter time of progressing from advanced adenoma to invasive cancer by previous modern studies. If the colonoscopy capacity is constrained, then those who receive colonoscopy at low ADR setting or those with higher baseline fecal hemoglobin concentration are more likely to be benefited from interval fit screening. Instant colorectal cancer was reduced by 53% with interval fit screening according to the observation of our study. So we are now considering to regularly advise people to undergo interval fit after a negative colonoscopy in our screening program. The positivity rate of interval cancer was rather high with 11.3, but if we consider the positive predict value of 8.68% for colorectal cancer, or the number need to fit or the number need to colonoscopy to detect one cancer, 
then such a trade-off is worthwhile and its impact on the screening program is considered as affordable. There are some limitations in our study. This is not a randomized controlled trial, therefore self-selection bias and other hidden confounding factor might have existed. And whether it is applicable to high quality colonoscopy setting is not clear because the ADR of the entire screening program was 32.3 during the 2004 to 2009, the inaugural five years of our program, and it had nowadays improved to 49% in 2020. It is also not clear whether the results are applicable to other uh, settings using colonoscopy as the primary screening tool. And finally, some of our screening participants underwent interval fit for more than once, but we were not able to explore its effect by further stratified analysis owing to the paucity of interval colorectal cancer cases. Finally, I would like to express my sincere thanks to our colleagues in the College of Public Health of National Taiwan University and in the Health Provincial Administration of the Taiwanese government for their long lasting strong support in the past 15 years. And I also want to thank to our professional society and all the uh, frontline public health worker for their big contribution to our program. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Hanmo. That's a, an excellent presentation to start off this, this symposium. Thank you for, for that. Um, we do have um, a longer session for questions after the next two speakers, but we, we have time for one or two questions uh, now. And uh, we have a couple that have popped up in the Q&A uh, box. So uh, just to remind you, please do use, use that Q&A function. Uh, so the first com comes from Paul Pinsky, who asks, uh, why did some people get interval fit tests and others did not? Yes, so in our program, some people go for uh, interval fit and uh, this is quite arbitrary and also depend on the advice by the uh, physician. So we don't have a, a routine or a strict guideline to advise people to go or do not uh, go for fit, uh, interval fit screening. So there may be some uh, self-selection bias. Some people uh, with better lifestyle habits probably may uh, went for screening, uh, but uh, we are not clear uh, what uh, drive them to go for screening. Yeah. Thank you. And, and then uh, Craig uh, Mowat um, from Scotland has asked um, if you can remind us what the fit threshold used in Taiwan is, please. Okay, we used uh, 20, yeah. 20, <coughs> thank 20, you, yeah. thanks. Uh, and then uh, Sunil Dolwani from uh, the United Kingdom, from, from Wales, uh, has asked uh, um, whether the results are largely explained, or do you think that they're largely explained by the quality of the baseline colonoscopy? You did touch on that, and we all know that's important. So uh, do you yeah. think that that is the um, explanation or part of the explanation? Yeah, actually the majority of PCCRC are caused by uh, inadequate colonoscopy or miss. Uh, neoplasm. So the main purpose of interval fit is probably for uh, picking up uh, overlooked lesion, I think. But uh, we are not aware whether uh, this is also applicable to uh, a setting with a very, very high ADR or high quality colonoscopy. Thank you. Um, and then one last uh, question uh, from Manon Spander, uh, and she asks, um, some of the PCCRCs are right-sided. Do you know what the miss rate for cancer by fit after a negative colonoscopy is? Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, this is a very interesting uh, question, but actually we don't, so far I don't have any idea about this. Yeah, sorry. Okay, and uh, maybe it's something we, we can discuss uh, later yeah, yes. on. Uh, now, there are some more questions coming in, which is fantastic, um, um, but I think it's time now to move on to our next two uh, 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 talks, uh, and then hopefully we'll have a chance to come back to answer some of the, the, those others uh, later on. So uh, at this juncture, I'll, I'll uh, thank you once more for an excellent presentation, and I shall hand over to Jeff. Thank you, Matt. Um, thank you, Hamo, and congratulations on that um, excellent presentation, very important study on uh, potential intervention. 
to reduce the risk of PCCRC. And so our next session will be focusing on whether uh, PCC PCCRCs are more lethal uh, compared to detected colorectal cancer. Uh, and our next speaker um, that we'll be presenting will be Dr. Anna Forsberg. Um, she will be highlighting, she's a prolific researcher from the uh, Karolinska, Karolinska uh, Institute in Sweden, and she'll be highlighting her uh, most recent publication in clinical uh, gastroenterology and hepatology. So uh, if we can get her slides up next, thank you. Great. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, the rate of PCCRC is an important quality measure of colonoscopy. And the goal is to get the three year rate lower than 5%. Most countries report figures about six to 9% when employing the way of definition of calculation. Anderson, Burr and Valori estimated the target rate of 2% for the PCCRC three year benchmark would be achievable. Uh, are PCCRCs mo mo mostly caused by missed or incompletely resected lesions where certain locations and conditions like IBD increase the risk? Or are the PCCRCs in general likely to have a different biology and a different survival? In this talk, I want to address the question about the different survival and the histology and if the histology differs between the two groups. A PCCRC is defined as a cancer diagnosed after colonoscopy where no cancer is detected. Most commonly, we report the three year PCCRC rate. This figure shows how the rate is calculated according to the WAO method. If there are multiple colonoscopies in the interval, only the first true positive colonoscopy and the first false negative colonoscopy are included into the um, calculations. In this study, uh, we collected from Swedish patients registers during the years 2003 to 12 for the colonoscopies and 3 to 15 for the cancers. Data on histology and staging was collected from the Swedish Quality Register of Colorectal Cancer. Uh, there were 352,000 individuals of which 55% were women with at least one colonoscopy. And 460,000 colonoscopies in 54% of women were evaluated. The number of false negative colonoscopies were 1,384, and the number of true positive colonoscopies were almost 20,000. In Sweden, the overall PCCRC3 rate for the 10 year period was 7.2%. And uh, we recognized the most important risk factors to be a prior CRC diagnosis, uh, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, or a prior polypectomy. When evaluating survival in PCCRCs, two types of bias must be avoided. And this determines when to start the clock for measuring the survival, that is time zero. The lead time bias makes that we uh, must measure the, the survival time from the time of the index colonoscopy and not from the date of the cancer diagnosis. Furthermore, to measure survival in PCCRC, we must measure the conditional survival, that is in three year PCCRCs, 36 months after the index colonoscopy. An individual with a PCCRC 
must survive at least until the time of the colorectal cancer diagnosis, and that is up to 36 months. And that means that some of the cancers are not included in the survival cal calculations. When we look at the conditional survival in this material, uh, we were excluding uh, those who had died before the time zero, and that was almost 6,000 individuals. 33% of the men, 29% of the women, 20% of the PCCRCs, and 32% of the detected cancers. And those that were excluded were, of, were um, more often advanced or undefined T stages. The survival was significantly poorer for PCCRC compared to detected CRC, and it's highly significant. And this uh, was seen across the stages. This was this, all the stages together. This picture shows an analysis of advanced stages stratified by sex. So here's men and here's women. Uh, and uh, here again, the survival and PCCRC is worse, both for men and for women. An interesting question is whether PCCRC tumors are different compared to detected tumors. If so, that might explain some of those cases that are not classified as missed or incompletely resected lesions. In this slide, we show a logistic regression analysis controlling for age and sex. And due to space limits, only significant results are presented and non-significant are omitted. The odds for PCCRCs are higher than for detected CRCs to have an earlier stage, to be right-sided, and interestingly, to have a lower differentiation grade. When comparing survival in men and women, we noticed an interaction between sex and PCCRC. And therefore, we fitted survival models stratified by sex. And again, non-significant results are omitted. Both for men and women, the hazards for death were higher in PCCRC compared to detected CRCs. The survival was shorter both for men and for women for left-sided uh, tumors compared to right-sided. The last table shows the difference in tumor characteristics in individuals with a conditional survival of 36 months. Logistic regressions models are fitted for each covariate, controlling only for age and sex. And here we have stratified on right-sided, left-sided, and rectal location. The odds for early stage were significantly higher for right-sided and rectal PCCRCs, but not for left-sided. For right-sided and rectal tumors, the odds were higher for not having free resection, resection margins. Rectal tumors had higher odds for mucinous tumors, whereas left-sided had higher odds of low differentiation grade. And one might speculate if the low differentiation grade in left-sided PCCRCs mirror a more, more fast-growing tumors or where, uh, whether the difference in resection margins might be a reflection of a different way 
of tumor growth. Uh, in summary, in this study, we have shown that PCCRCs have a vast conditional survival compared to detected CRCs. This is seen across the CRC stages. Women with PCCRC have a worst, worst survival compared to men. And we see a different uh, histology in the PCCRCs. And one can ask if this might be part of the explanation uh, why we have PCCRCs. And I thank you for letting me present this. And I also want to thank my co-workers for this work. And they are listed there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Forsberg. Um, and so if uh, the audience have, if, you, if they have any questions, please uh, type it into the Q&A. So while we're waiting for questions, I have a question. Um, could the difference also be explained um, by therapy, treatment therapy in terms of survival? I cannot answer that. Uh, do you mean that uh, CRCs and detected CRCs should have different therapies or? Yeah, I, were there differences in terms of treatment uh, management by stage? I mean, uh, certain types of chemotherapy. Um, I mean, yeah. obviously, uh, this is an earlier period, so immunotherapies were not utilized. Um, and whether by microsatellite uh, status, was that also? a uh, potential explanation of survival differences. Mm. It might be, but I, I cannot really answer the question. And then we have one more question from uh, Dr. Linda Rabinick. Um, can you explain a little bit more about uh, uh, the different histology and how that influenced um, survival differences? Mm. Uh, what we saw that uh, in rectal cancers, there were more often uh, mucinous tumors uh, in the PCCRCs compared to the de detected CRCs. And mucinous tumors uh, seem to have a, a worse survival. And in the left-sided uh, tumors, uh, the was uh, higher odds for having a, a low differentiation grade. And that might also be an explanation for the lower survival in left-sided tumors. And in right-sided and rectal tumors, we saw that uh, the resection margins were not free uh, in a higher degree in the PCCRCs compared to the detected CRCs. So, there seem to be some small differences in the microscopy of, of uh, PCCRCs and detected CRCs. It would be interesting to, to look at the MSI status and, and so, but we do not have this data. We have another question from Com uh, Morin. Uh, can you identify the, or can you explain a little bit more about the quality of the original colonoscopy? Uh, we do not have that data. This is register studies. So we do not have uh, any quality data. Uh, we do not know how they have uh, been uh, cleaned or uh, if the colonoscopies are complete. So it's just register the data. So we have to lean on the uh, large amount of, of uh, colonoscopies. Uh, what we have seen in Sweden during the years is that we perform more high quality colonoscopies and, and uh, only 20 years ago, there were people performing 20 to 50 colonoscopies a year, but now we have more and more full-time colonoscopies. So the, the quality is getting 
better and better. Okay. We have another uh, two questions. Um, so this is from S Silvia Sendoliano. Um, do we have, uh, did you find a relationship between PCCRCs and Lynch syndrome in your study? Uh, unfortunately, we do not have data whether we have Lynch syndrome or not in the registers, but we, uh, we in, in earlier studies, we performed some uh, analysis to, to try to address this and some part may be due to Lynch syndrome, but Lynch syndrome is quite uh, seldomly found in Sweden. It's about one to four uh, percent only. So, so I don't think that Lynch syndrome can explain more than a little bit of it. And then lastly, we have another uh, question from Roland Valori. Um, did you include IBD uh, patients in your analysis? Uh, yes. Between patients? Okay. All right. And then lastly, we have from Rocky Schoen. Uh, did you see the same distribution in the non-interval fit group? Um, oh, this is actually related to uh, the previous study. Yeah. Um, so I apologize for that. I cannot answer that question. Um, so we'll uh, thank you so much, Dr. Forsberg, on this really important stu uh, study. Um, we'll um, step away and transition to the third presentation. Um, and so our third talk will be presented by uh, Fahima Dosa. Uh, She's a uh, general, residence, uh, general surgery resident at the University of Toronto and a PhD student also too um, at the University of Toronto in Canada. And she will be, um, uh, her talk is focused on our PCCRCs more lethal than detected colorectal cancer uh, from a Canadian perspective. All right, thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, and thank you to the organization for the opportunity to present this work today. Um, it's a bit of a different perspective than the one presented by Dr. Forsberg, and I hope to highlight why we think we had the conclusions that we did. But I think um, as we start to think about um, lethality of PCCRCs, it's important to keep in the back of our head the mechanisms that have been touched on and alluded to by the previous presenter. Again, the, the three main ways that we think about PCCRCs occurring are through missed neoplasms, um, incomplete resection of polyps or neoplasms, and then new neoplasia. And so if we think about how each of these mechanisms might lead to greater lethality from PCCRCs versus detected cancers, um, for the first two categories, those of missed neoplasms or incomplete resections, um, so the mechanism would essentially be that of late detection. Um, and so these individuals are having missed lesions uh, and then going on to develop more advanced disease versus uh, those who develop new neoplasia after their index colonoscopy. We'd really expect that to be more of an aggressive tumor biology, not going through the typical adenoma carcinoma sequence, um, but developing much more quickly. And I want you to keep this framework in mind as you think about uh, whether PCCRCs could have increased lethality than the detected lesion. Um, that's because I want us to think about disease stage. Uh, interestingly, if we, if we do believe that most PCCRCs are being caused by the first two categories, those of missed neoplasms or incomplete resections of polyps, uh, then it's, we should see some kind of signal uh, in the studies that have been done that PCCRCs tend to have more advanced stages. Uh, in contrast, many of the studies actually demonstrate the opposite. Uh, that when PCCRCs are detected, they tend to present at earlier stages. One important study that I think presents a conflicting viewpoint of that is this study that uh, done by Govinda Rajan et al. Uh, using Ontario administrative data, where they did show that their PCCRCs did demonstrate a greater rate of stage four disease. Um, but if you look at this table, the difference in stage four disease uh, isn't that large certainly doesn't seem large enough to explain the very large survival differences, overall survival differences, detected lesions. Um, the other thing I'll point out here is that, you know, we don't see more stage three disease. We don't really see more stage two disease among PCCRCs. 
Uh, that being said, I think um, the other thing I'll point out here is that a number of PCCRCs in the study did have missing stage, um, and one can argue as to why that might be. But overall, it doesn't seem like we have enough data to support that these lesions are presenting at later stages or as more advanced disease when they are picked up. It's obviously challenging to study PCCRCs for a number of reasons. One of those is they're generally and hopefully a relatively rare outcome. Um, and so many of the studies, especially those that are institution-based, uh, have relatively small samples. And that's led to a reliance on administrative data, which itself presents its own challenges. Um, obviously, as Dr. Forsberg touched on, there are issues of lead time bias as well as immortal time in the majority of studies. Um, and also, as I alluded to, the limitations of administrative data itself. And I want to specifically touch on something that was highlighted in this Danish study of PCCRCs, uh, where the authors interestingly compared the administrative definition and classification of PCCRCs uh, to a chart review to confirm how often PCCRCs were being misclassified. And their misclassification rate was 16%. What they were finding as the most common reasons for misclassification were that uh, the individual's index colonoscopy was actually a flexible sigmoidoscopy, patients had prior diagnoses of colorectal cancer, or that pathology review didn't confirm that they had adenocarcinoma. Um, and so in moving forward, I think that we should look at administrative data studies with a grain of salt and almost expect that there will be some degree of misclassification that may be important to interpreting the results. Um, so in, in lieu of that, we uh, wanted to study this question again using administrative data. Uh, our study was not initially aimed at looking at survival, but we actually wanted to look at uh, characteristics, patient procedural and endoscopist uh, that were related to the development of PCCRC. Uh, and as a secondary aim, uh, we were interested in looking at survival. And so it's the secondary aim that I'll present data on today. Uh, so this was our study. Again, uh, the focus of it was on factors associated with the development of PCCRC, um, and that influenced the design of the study, but I still think that there are important conclusions that we can draw from uh, our survival analysis in the study. Uh, so this was a population-based study that was done in Ontario, Canada, using administrative data sets. Uh, we were looking at patients who had been diagnosed with colorectal cancer from 2000 to 2005, um, different from some other studies, we know that for inclusion in our study, uh, the index colonoscopy had to be complete up to the area of the colon where the cancer was uh, ended up being found. Uh, and fortunately, we have a claims-based system where we're able to determine how far uh, the endoscopist was able to get to. And so that was one of our inclusion criteria. Um, and also different from other studies is we excluded uh, the high-risk pathologies. So we excluded individuals who had pre-existing uh, diagnoses of colorectal cancer. We excluded those with IBD and those who had previously undergone colonic resection. And that was to help tease out uh, the actual relationships here outside of the high-risk populations. Um, and using the WEO definitions, uh, we define detected CRCs as those within six months of the index colonoscopy and PCCRCs as those between six months to three years uh, from the colonoscopy. Um, one of the things that we thought in the study was actually to confirm uh, the definitions that we were giving to these individuals in the classification system uh, based on that Danish work that I showed earlier. Um, so we started by taking all of the individuals who met our inclusion criteria and assigning an institution to them. And that was based on where they had had their surgery, if they did undergo surgery. Otherwise, it was based on where they had had cancer-related admissions to hospital, or uh, if that wasn't present, where they had had their colonoscopy. And once all individuals had an institution assigned, uh, we took a random sample. Our goal was to include 500 PCCRCs. And we used an institution-based sampling frame for that. Uh, and then we matched each PCCRC patient with one from the same institution who had had a detected CRC. And then finally, we did a chart review uh, where we went through colonoscopy reports at these various institutions, as well as admission notes to confirm the classification of these individuals. Uh, as I mentioned, a secondary outcome of our work was our survival analysis, which I'll present today. And um, time zero for our analysis was the date of diagnosis. 
Uh, so I will say up front that certainly uh, our study does leave itself open to there being a degree of lead time bias. Uh, however, in picking the time zero as the date of the index colonoscopy, we're making the assumption that all of these patients had a missed lesion rather than falling into that second category or the third category of developing new lesions within the interval between their index colonoscopy and their diagnosis. Uh, and then we did univariable as well as multivariable analyses. Our Cox models were adjusted for age, sex, and the location of the tumor. Uh, so when we looked at our sample, 8% of individuals overall met our definition of PCCRC over this time period. Um, and when we tried to confirm the diagnoses, 95% of individuals with detected CRCs uh, had a confirmation of that diagnosis whereas we only found 84% of those with an administrative definition of PCCRC, in fact, had that uh, criteria on chart review. And so we had a similar misclassification rate as the Danish study I presented earlier. And again, we had similar reasons for misclassification, the most common being that the index colonoscopy was actually miscoded and was a flexible sigmoidoscopy. Uh, this is just a general sense of the characteristics of our patient populations. Um, again, so we had targeted 500 PCCRCs. Some of them, uh, we whittled our way down to 367, as some of them uh, we couldn't confirm the diagnosis of, and others uh, we uh, couldn't find any information on when we did a chart review. Uh, so this is the population we were left with. Um, unsurprisingly, uh, shown by other authors as well, the individuals with PCCRCs tended to be older, a uh, higher proportion were female. Uh, less of them actually presented with symptoms at the time of their index colonoscopy. We did have some information on the quality of the colonoscopy um, and more of them tended to have complete colonoscopies. Uh, we did attempt to look at the uh, adequacy of the bowel prep. However, a lot of that information was missing and so I'm not presenting it here today. Um, and similar to other authors, we saw a preponderance of right-sided lesions uh, in the PCCRC group. So our outcome here was overall survival, and this was our Kaplan-Meier. So at first, it was very striking on our univariable analysis. Uh, when we looked at five-year overall survival, it was about 50% in the PCCRC group versus 60% in the detected group. So quite a substantial difference between the two. Uh, however, on multivariable analysis, and again, we didn't adjust for very many factors, just age, sex, and tumor location, uh, were significantly attenuated and to the point where we were unable to find a statistically significant difference in overall survival between the two groups. Um, so why might that be? Uh, I think that there, there are a number of um, speculations that we can make, but I think probably the factor in our adjustment that led to the greatest attenuation uh, was probably that of tumor location. And whether it's tumor location itself, or as Dr. Forsberg alluded to, uh, histologic differences uh, that go alongside differences in tumor location, it's hard to say with our data. Uh, certainly, we didn't have information on MSI status for these patients. Um, but I think it is uh, somewhat interesting that um, initially there was such a big difference between the two groups and it was considerably attenuated just with a bit of adjustment. And so uh, I think that there are features of our study that uh, can explain why our results might be different uh, you've already seen today or those you might have read from other authors. I think part of that is simply because we excluded those with high-risk lesions, uh, specifically the IBD population. Um, in addition to that, we did require that all of these individuals had a colonoscopy that went up to at least the site of where the tumor was eventually identified. Um, we also required a diagnostic confirmation through chart review, and if uh, we couldn't uh, appropriately classify these patients on chart review, they were ultimately excluded from our study. Uh, and then finally, uh, we thought about the causal pathways and as we thought about what we might want to adjust for. And I think some previous studies have adjusted for things such as uh, stage of cancer at the time that they're developing their models. Uh, and we felt that factors such as that are probably more likely along the causal pathway. And so we didn't want to over adjust uh, for some of those elements. So I think the combination of these factors might be C, uh, differences on our multivariable analysis. And so uh, coming back to where I started, um, 
why is it that we might expect that PCCRCs could be more lethal? Um, certainly from our study, I don't think that we have strong evidence that these individuals are presenting with more advanced disease and that's what's driving differences that are being seen. Um, rather, it does seem, as Dr. Forsberg mentioned, that this might be related to histology of lesions. It could be related to where they're presenting in the colon. And there may be a degree of these that um, simply follow the MSI pathway uh, and develop a bit more quickly. Uh, unfortunately, that means I'm leaving you with a conclusion that is probably the least favorable, which is I don't think we have enough information yet to answer this question. Um, but I, I think it would be interesting. There are a number of studies that have now tried to look at this question uh, and simply, you know, meta regressing on the of, uh, or the proportion of patients who have right-sided lesions uh, across these studies could provide some valuable information. Uh, so with that, I want to thank everyone for their time and I'm happy uh, to answer questions now or later and look forward to the discussion on this topic. Well, thanks, Fahima. Um, another excellent presentation. Um, so we have uh, a few minutes for uh, four questions. Um, so please use the Q&A box uh, to pitch questions uh, either uh, directly relating to Fahima's talk or in the five minutes or so that we have left, uh, uh, more general questions. Um, so uh, it's, it's quite interesting. We had two very similar uh, uh, talks there. That was de deliberate. Um, uh, do you um, do you have any thoughts about uh, where we should go next with this work? I mean, you, you, you sort of hinted on that um, uh, uh, just towards the end there. But uh, if there was one piece of work that you think uh, we sh you know needs to be done. Um, what would you have at, at the top of your priority list? Yeah, I I think to me what stands out is actually teasing out how much of this, how much of these differences that we're seeing in survival are related to uh, the to MSI related tumors. Uh, it almost seems like there's a disconnect. There are studies that look specifically at MSI and show that you have a higher proportion of these PCCRCs being MSI. Um, and then you have a separate set of studies that look at survival. But tying the two together, I think, will be quite important. And um, histology with the survival elements, I think, is what's missing right now. Thank you. Uh, and I guess just to the you know, wide international audience that we have, can I pitch the same? Same question to you too. Uh, so Jeff and I uh, are co-chairs of the PCCRC subgroup. So it will be really interesting if you could uh, pitch uh, your thoughts on where this group can go next or what research questions we should be addressing into the Q&A box. And we'll do our best to uh, um, uh, keep a list of those and, and that will help us to uh, um, uh, uh, have a steer for, for, uh, for future meetings. Uh, so we have a question from Zohar Levy. Um, uh, can you develop an algorithm to avoid PCCRC misclassification? Uh, so uh, Fahima, I don't know if you have any, any particular thoughts about, about that. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, knowing the billing system in Ontario, I think that that would be quite challenging to do. I mean, essentially the biggest problem is uh, endoscopists who are incorrectly billing uh, their scopes. At least uh, if, like the problem we saw was this misclassification of colonoscopies and flexible sigmoidoscopies. Um, how we can get around that, uh, I'm not too sure at this point. I think, I think uh, Matt's frozen um, on his connection. So um, happy to be able to uh, facilitate the next question. Uh, there's a few more that are uh, coming in. And this is probably to the group, uh, would a randomized trial um, 
specifically looking at proximal serrated lesions help in answering part of the main question with quality assurance at baseline colonoscopy. Um, this is to any of the discussants in this panel. I'm very sorry about that. I, I, I dropped out, um, um, so I didn't hear the answer to the last question. Um, I'm sure you've moved on. Um, uh, but uh, just to remind, you probably mentioned this already, uh, just to remind everybody that um, the WEO um, uh, PCCRC works. So there's two publications, uh, uh, and in the gastroenterology publication, there is an algorithm for how to categorize PCCRCs. Uh, I'd be quite interested to know from... Anna, um, do you have, uh, and in fact, Yuri asked this question um, too, uh, do you have any idea from, from your work what proportion of lesions uh, were missed or incompletely resected and, and what proportion uh, may well be uh, true de novo lesions? I cannot estimate that from uh, registered data, so, so I don't know. I plan to do some studies on um, screening patients, and then uh, I think that I can answer that question better. But based on registered data, it's, it's not feasible to do that. It is difficult, and really, I, I, I guess it lends itself more to a, uh, a you know, single centre or smaller group piece of work where you can look into individual cases in more detail. And um, I don't know whether Roland Valori's group's work has been published yet, but certainly if if, if it hasn't, uh, it, it's imminent. There is a piece of work looking at categorization of, of PCCRCs using that WEO algorithm. So uh, I'd uh, I recommend that you, that you look that out. And, and we, we have a similar piece of work from, from our group in the northeast of England, um, uh, which is about to be published in endoscopy, uh, which looks at the other categorization that's in that WEO doc document, which is how many PCCRCs are true interval cancers by definition, and how many are non-interval cancers. Uh, um, so if you think that interval cancer is synonymous with PCCRC, it's not. Um, uh, so I would recommend that you uh, um, download a copy of that uh, gastroenterology WEO uh, consensus statement and, and, and familiarise yourself with the different terminology. It is complex, I, I, I accept. Um, so um, we've overshot a little bit. You were going to have a five minute a breather uh, in between the, the, the two sessions. Uh, it's now down to two or one minute. Um, um, but uh, I, I guess now is the time for us to, to call this uh, meeting uh, to a, a close. I'd just like to thank um, my co-chair, Jeff, and the three speakers, Anna, Fahima, and Hanmo. Uh, excellent presentations, really stimulating. Do keep those questions uh, for future pieces of work coming in that Q&A box, and we'll try and pick those uh, as we go along. Uh, you have a couple of minutes uh, break and then we'll move on to the, the next part of this session which is uh, focusing on, on surveillance. So uh, thank you for your attention.
Hello, good afternoon and welcome to this, uh, the second part of this uh, amazing webinar. We are going now to talk about surveillance after uh, colonic neoplasm with two wonderful talks. I would like to introduce my co-chair Yuri Ladabaum from San Francisco in the United States. And we will uh, have two talks. The first will be uh, given by my colleague, uh, Sarah, Sandra baile maxia that will talk about a systematic review of meta-analysis on surveillance after excision of high-risk adenomas in order to address the characteristics of high-risk adenomas that are really of high risk. And then Yuri will talk about why are, uh, if we are successful reducing colorectal cancer risk in patients with baseline high-risk adenomas in order to address this apparent paradox of having risk of cancer after removing high-risk lesions. Thank then, you, Rodrigo. Okay. It's my, my pleasure to be part of this session. And without further ado, Sandra, please uh, present to us your findings of your systematic review. Sandra is in her last year of training. And actually, last month, she will very soon be a full-fledged attending gastroenterologist. We're looking forward to your talk, Sandra. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Yuri, for your uh, kind introduction. As Yuri said, I'm going to present this study that is a systematic review of meta-analysis on risk factors for metachronous colorectal cancer or advanced polyps after endoscopic resection of premalignant lesions. Um, well, as you all know, the removal of adenomas has proven to reduce the colorectal cancer incidence and its mortality. And also, as you can see in the figure, there is a subpopulation of patients with adenoma with high-risk features where the risk is higher, supporting surveillance, especially in this population. Different guidelines have established different uh, post-polypectomy surveillance recommendation. Um, uh, in general terms, as you can see in the table, the uh, in general terms recommended surveillance for the uh, adenomas for, with high-risk features is three years. However, in the recently published ESG guidelines, they do not recommend endoscopic surveillance for patients with up to four adenomas or adenomas with villous component. And even more, the European Commission and the US Multi-Society Task Force guidelines established an even higher risk with a recommended interval of surveillance of only one year. All this has led to postpolypectomy surveillance becoming one of the main indications of colonoscopy, accounting for almost 25% of colonoscopies in Western countries in male patients older than 50 years. Our hypothesis is based on what has been previously suggested in other studies, that is that some of the current high-risk characteristics, namely multiplicity, size, high rate dysplasia, or villous structure may relate to a higher risk of metachronous colorectal cancer or advanced lesions than the others. And therefore some patients with high risk adenoma may not require endoscopic surveillance. Our aim was to assess which specific adenoma attributes related with a higher risk of development of metachronous colorectal cancer or advanced adenoma and therefore required endoscopic surveillance. In order to do so, we perform a systematic review and meta-analysis we establish as our main outcomes the incidence of metachronous advanced adenoma, incidence of metachronous colorectal cancer, and colorectal cancer mortality. And we uh, consider different risk groups, as you can see in the boxes, uh, calculated the outcomes in each one of them. At the beginning of our study, we formulated different PICO questions where the population were the different risk categories, the intervention was colonoscopy, the outcomes were the one that I previously mentioned, and we established different comparison groups, such as patients with non-advanced adenoma, population with normal colonoscopy, or general population. We perform a literature search in the databases of PADMED, the Cochrane Library and Invase from inception to July 2020. No publication date or status restrictions were applied, and we restricted language to English, Spanish, and French. We included core studies, case control studies, and clinical trials, and excluded those studies which included patients younger than 18 years, patients with any high risk condition for colorectal cancer, or patients with a personal history of colorectal cancer. Also, we searched the references of related articles and meta-analysis for eligible studies, which we refer to as cross-references. 
well, as you can see in the figure, the initial search returned 4,946 articles, of which 4,599 remain after the application. After applying inclusion and exclusion criteria and adding the cross references, we selected 174 studies for full text assessment. And finally, 68 studies were included in the statistical analysis. Of those, 63 were core studies, two were case control studies, and three were clinical trials, with a total of 731,040 patients, with a mean age of 60 years and 63% of males. The mean duration of follow-up was 5.1 years. As you can see in the table, we calculated the colorectal cancer incidence per 1,000 person years for each one of the risk categories. That was 2.0 for advanced adenoma, 1.3 for high-risk adenoma, 2.6 for adenomas of 20 millimeters or more, 1.6 for adenomas of 10 millimeters or more, 1.2 for patients with five or more adenomas, 1.4 for three or more adenomas, 2.1 for villous component, and 2.8 for high-grade dysplasia. Now I'm going to present the pool risk ratio for in the comparison for each one of the, of the risk categories. As you can see in the presentation, the poor risk ratio for colorectal cancer incidence for patients with high risk adenoma in comparison with those with non-advanced adenoma was 2.21. And the poor risk ratio for colorectal cancer incidence when comparing patients with high risk adenoma with patients with normal colonoscopy was 2.72. Also for this specific uh, risk category, we could we could calculate the, the pool risk ratio for colorectal cancer mortality, which was 2.34 when compared with patients with non-advanced adenoma and 2.62 when compared with normal colonoscopy. As for adenoma size, the pool risk ratio for colorectal cancer incidence when comparing patients with adenomas of 20 millimeters or more versus those with adenomas smaller than 20 millimeters was 3.09. When comparing patients with adenoma of 20 millimeters or more versus those with adenomas from 10 to 19 millimeters was 2.08. The pool risk ratio when comparing adenomas from 10 to 19 millimeters versus those smaller than 10 millimeters was 1.73. And when comparing adenomas of 10 or more millimeters versus those smaller was 1.61. In this last uh, comparison, we did not reach the statistical significance. As for adenoma number, we also make different analyses to establish the pool risk ratio for colorectal cancer incidence. As you can see in the presentation, we compare patients with five or more adenomas versus less than five, more than five versus three to four, three to four versus less than three, and three or more versus less than three. In all these analyses, we did not reach the statistical significance, but things change when we calculated the pool risk ratio for metachronous advanced adenoma which was 2.39 when comparing patients with five adenoma or more versus less than five, 1.64 when comparing patients with five or more adenomas versus three to four, 1.86 when comparing three to four versus less than three adenomas, and 2.72 when comparing three to more, three or more versus less than three. As for Bilo's component, the pool risk ratio for colorectal cancer incidence when compared with patients with tubular adenomas was 1.75, and when compared with patients with normal colonoscopy, 3.58. And finally, for high-grade dysplasia, the pool risk ratio for colorectal cancer incidence was 2.94 when compared with adenomas with low-grade dysplasia, and 6.62 when compared with patients with normal colonoscopy. Finally, we calculated the absolute risk reduction and the number needed to scope for each one of the risk categories in comparison with patients with non advanced adenoma or normal colonoscopy. As you can see in the table, the number needed to scope are, is relatively high for all the categories, but is the lowest for the category of advanced adenoma in general, adenomas of 20 millimeters or more, and high grade dysplasia, and is the highest for patients with five or more adenomas and patients with three or more adenomas. So to sum up, uh, our conclusion is that metachronous colorectal cancer risk is significantly higher in patients with baseline adenomas with high-grade dysplasia, below component, or size of 10 millimeters or more, which supports an indication for surveillance in this population. However, multiplicity does not seem substantially related with a higher colorectal cancer risk, and therefore these patients may not benefit from endoscopic surveillance. Thank you very much. Sandra, th thank you very much. That, that's an enormous amount of work and 
I know there are other things that you didn't yet show. So there, there's a, a, lot of, a lot of interesting data here. Um, while we wait for questions, and I encourage you to write them in the Q&A session, let, or the Q&A box, let, let me start by asking you how you would put this in, in the context of how these studies are done, because these are not randomized trials, right? So are there any warnings here for potential self-selection, who's getting surveillance, who isn't? Uh, and, and could that affect things enough that you'd say, be careful about these estimates, or, or you really think that these are, are reliable, the risk of bias is low? Well, we are uh, now performing the, the risk of bias assessment that every meta-analysis should have. So we will have to wait for, for that. But also in some of our uh, forest plots, as you could see, the heterogeneity is uh, quite high. So some results might, might be taken with caution. But in general, we, we did that real work. And I think it's at least worth considering. Thank you. We have one question here, Catherine Dubay. The search excluded high-risk populations. How were these defined? Well, uh, it's a um, meta-analysis, so uh, it, where the exclusion criteria of most of the, the studies, they excluded uh, patients with any high-risk condition like inflammatory bowel disease or lead syndrome or any polyposis. Okay, I see Chesa there. Yeah, hello, uh, Rodrigo and... Uh... Uri, I also uh, was really terribly surprised by this uh, presentation, Sandra, because what is really new for me is the uh, way you, 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 you gave this absolute data. I don't know if you can put back uh, your presentation uh, and sure. uh, go back uh, to your slide where, where you did a table with all of the absolute risk of colon cancer incidence uh, uh, after uh, a polypectomy. I think this is uh, great because for the first time, no, no, Sandra, not this one. The one, it was in the mid uh, with the absolute risk. Go no. back, go back, go back again. Because the relative risk, are, I mean, okay, this, I think it was that one. No, uh, Sandra, I think it was the previous one where you had the absolute risk of cancer per follow-up year. It was something like a two per yeah, uh, rectal cancer. Yeah. yeah, this one. Yeah, this one, okay. So this is really new uh, to me, to see all of them in one synoptic table. And we understand a lot. Uh, I don't know, Rodrigo also, Matt is here, but I feel that the risk of interval cancer after one negative colonoscopy is in between 0 0.5 to 1 per 1,000 year person of follow-up. Now, Sandra, by looking at this, uh, I realized that the risk is increased, but not so much, because the absolute risk only moves uh, from 1 to 2 per 1,000 uh, year of follow-up. So it is a risk that is uh, manageable. It's not putting this patient at an excessive uh, increased risk as compared with a person who had a negative colonoscopy. I think that this table is for me a new way to look at uh, uh, surveillance uh, uh, data and we should uh, learn to think of uh, this uh, uh, approach. I don't know uh, what you think uh, uh, about it uh, and uh, whether this may be more useful than the relative risk or the multivariate analysis, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that, that, that's true. The, the, I, I think we, we are seeing the thing clearer when we talk about absolute risk than, than with relative risk. Um, it is also possible that there are particular conditions that, that, that would uh, provoke a higher risk. Uh, for, for instance, Hammo has showed before that uh, coming from a fit positive uh, colonoscopy may be different than coming from, uh, from primary screening colonoscopy. We, we will have to analyze that. Probably we will have the, the opportunity of analyzing that in the EPOS trial that will answer a lot of questions uh, a lot of open questions on that, but uh, th th that's true. I think uh, I think it's very interesting to read the the results in terms of 
absolute risk as, as, as well as in terms of number needed to screen, as Sandra showed in the last slide, that, that, that give us uh, for new guidelines and for everything uh, more clear results. Yeah, uh, Rodrigo, I fully agree. Uh, the number needed to screen is at the end uh, uh, the opposite of this, and it allows us uh, to create pictogram uh, that are very useful to patient, uh, as uh, Brett Tower did on the BMJ on the screening. Um, the problem, uh, I feel that we need a comparator. And since we have this absolute data, I would use per comparator uh, the absolute risk of cancer incidence uh, in, um, uh, after uh, primary screening colonoscopy, or Rodrigo, as you said, uh, after FIT, positive colonoscopy, the risk is about one per 1,000, so it's not so much different from this. So I would uh, compare this table with the risk of cancer after a negative uh, um, colonoscopy. I feel this is very good uh, and sensible approach uh, that even patients would understand. I don't know, Uri, if in the United States it'd be successful. Uh, potentially, potentially, but I, I agree with your overall point that these absolute risks are very important. And then what do we compare them to? That's, I think, the right way to think about it. Uh, hold on to those thoughts because I, I think this will play out in the next talk as well, I hope. I do want to get to two questions here, both on, on um, Villas. So from Rocky Schoen, Villas came out as significant, yet the guidelines do not recommend Villas adenomas less than 10 millimeters, should be considered high risk or advanced. Should that be changed? And then maybe before that, Urs Marbet, do you think that the villus component in the adenoma is an independent risk factor to increase the risk of CRC? So maybe first address the second one, is villus a risk factor? Rocky's question says, yes, it came out of significant. So is it, is it important? And if so, should small ones be considered high risk or advanced? Well, according to our results, the villus component showed that was associated with a higher risk of colorectal cancer more than multiplicity, for instance. So in that term, we, I think that we should consider as a risk factor for colorectal cancer. I don't know. It, is, it, it, it is really difficult to, to answer the question of Rocky because uh, the results are not so uh, so adequately separate uh, between polyps larger and uh, smaller than one centimeter? This, this is a very good question. It, the majority, it is the same with high-grade dysplasia. The majority of polyps with high-grade dysplasia with villous components are larger than one centimeter. And probably in the size is the answer for the majority of things. But uh, the, it, it, is, it is not possible to separate polyps because in the studies, they are not separate. Um, Uri, can I make two points about this? So first, um, uh, Rodrigo, you are fully right. At the end, uh, we need uh, a synoptic table to understand the attributable risk. How much risk is to be attributed to high-grade dysplasia, villus, uh, or um, uh, size? This depends uh, on the relative prevalence of each factor and on the increase uh, in the magnitude of uh, uh, risk. That's um, uh, probably this cannot be extracted uh, by this meta analysis. But for instance, uh, URI in America, you have a lot of data from this North America uh, consortium. Maybe you could give us uh, the proportion of risk uh, that can be attributed uh, to each one. Regarding velocity, I was with Rodrigo while doing our guideline. And guess what? It was the pathologist uh, who was against. Uh, the velocity, because at the end, uh, the uh, velocity has a lot of inter-observer variability. Then they have this crazy idea that it must be more than 20% or more than 25%. And what if it is a 24%? Uh, and then, as Rodrigo said, it's quite frequently associated with high-grade dysplasia or with the size more than 10 millimeter. Most of the time, it's also in a pedunculated lesion probably at, at a lower risk of uh, incomplete uh, uh, recession. So this was the uh, decision uh, behind it. Yeah, good points, Chancellor. One last question here by Matt. Is the issue with multiplicity that the mean follow-up is short at five years? So in all probability, the colorectal cancer detector were those that were missed. 
either cancers or polyps, rather than de novo, i.e. longer follow-up is required to identify those who are at increased risk of new onset CRC. And multiplicity may be an indication of field effect. So your thoughts on the multiplicity issue and that, 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 the time that frame links, to see yeah. an effect. That, that links with, with uh, your talk, Yuri, which are the reasons because we are, uh, we are having uh, cancer after removal of lesions. Probably there is a field effect, but no, nobody has demonstrated that. The, the question here, uh, as, as you know, is that multiplicity is increasing <clears throat> with highest uh, quality of colonoscopy. And probably it's not, in our, in our systematic review, it's not uh, a real risk factor. So, so maybe uh, we <clears throat> should forget about multiplicity and risk factor. I, I, I don't know, we, we, we have to discuss. Can I make a point, uh, Uri, here? Because I read the chat by Matt. So, uh, Matt, I don't know where you are, but in your WEO uh, position statement, you put four years as uh, a cutoff for missed cancer. But then some, sometimes you, you go down to three years. And now I, I see that you go up to five years. So it, it's still difficult to define exactly uh, when the cancer may be attributed to a plausibly missed uh, uh, diagnosis. But having said that, I fully uh, agree with you. And uh, I think this difference between uh, here in Europe uh, and what you do in America, Uri. When we have a patient with uh, more than five adenoma, I'm quite uh, confident uh, in neglecting uh, endoscopic surveillance uh, because I send this patient to FIT. And I guess, uh, uh, Matt, uh, that FIT has a, at least 70% sensitivity for detecting what you correctly define as new cancer. On the other hand, uh, Uri, I feel that Matt uh, point uh, is very well taken in uh, America because uh, for instance, to send a patient after 10 years to colonoscopy could expose this patient uh, to an excess risk between the fifth year, when here in Europe we recall them to fit, uh, and 10 years. So, Uri, how do you behave with uh, more than five adenoma? Do you recall to colonoscopy earlier? Yes. I mean, I can't, I can't quote your data. Maybe there are data out there about what people actually do, but I think the clinical practice is these patients are, are considered at higher risk and they're brought back after a few years, probably three, three to five years. It depends on the endoscopist. My guess is that traditionally endoscopists have been aggressive with these patients as what brought them back in three years, maybe in some cases even less if there, if there are larger lesions. Now, maybe that's over surveillance, but my guess is that as a country, the clinical practice has erred on that side. These patients are not being sent away for a long interval. Mm -hmm. uh, one other question here. Was there any analysis, this is from Sunil Dalwani, was there any analysis of the impact of pathologist inter-observer variation on degree of velocity or degree of dysplasia? Well, uh, it's, uh, uh, it depends on the, it depending on the study, there were some studies where they performed this kind of inter-observer variation analysis and some of them they didn't. So we just pulled all the, all the results together. So it's difficult to say. Where, where for sure there is inter-observer variability is in the definition of serrated polyps. We have made in parallel another <clears throat> systematic review meta-analysis with serrated polyps. And here it is very well described the inter-observer variability in the diagnosis. There is also, of course, inter-observer variability uh, in the diagnosis of high-grid dysplasia or, or biologicity. Uh, that, that, that's a problem we have to deal with, but we, 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 we uh, sometimes we think that the pathologies are uh, magic, but uh, they are persons like, like, like us, and sometimes they, they, they uh, make mistakes. But, Rodrigo, uh, should, should we do the second talk? Chester, you want to make the comment now or at the end? I mean, I have a provocative comment, Uri. We Go are ahead. talking about velocity, high-grade dysplasia, defined 50, no, maybe 70 years ago by Morrison. Is it possible that we are unable to move to any new molecular 
biomarker to tell us uh, and to predict uh, more tailored, uh, personalized risk of uh, um, cancer in uh, surveillance. Rodrigo, yeah, you, a, you know a, everything about this. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that, that is a great thought. Uh, th th those of you who were able to attend the, the session on, what, on what, are the, um, what, what should be the new position statement about developing new tests that Graham Young and others organized. There was a session there where we talked about what's the target. There are some, some very, very interesting comments by Beatriz Carvalho on whether that is possible. But yes, in the new era, can we think about a more sophisticated way of, of defining risk? And is, is there a molecular marker? It's a bit of a circular issue, right? How do you prove it? But excellent thought. Keep thinking along those lines. And uh, for those of you interested in what was presented at the session, it's recorded and available. How about if we move on and we encourage more discussion at the end of the next presentation, Rodrigo, is that okay? Okay, next presentation is made by Yuri Ladabon. Uh, he is going to tell us about uh, if we are successful reducing colorectal cancer ring in patients with baseline high risk adenoma. And he proposed different uh, answers for discussion afterwards. Thanks, Rodrigo. We, we may be risking chaos, but we are ready to promote people to a panelist role. If you want to speak the way, for instance, the chess had a joint, let us know by raising your hand. We want to, this to be as interactive as possible. I don't know how well it'll work. Okay, so mm -hmm. let's begin here. Why do post-colonoscopy colorectal cancers happen? We've seen various speakers talk about this. We may be missing the cancer. We may be missing the precursor. We may be incompletely resecting the precursor, or there could be a completely de novo lesion that is growing fast. So how do we think about precursors and then metachronous colorectal cancer? And to a first approximation, we could think that colorectal cancer is attributable to, to the following. If, if you don't remove the lesion, maybe the most important thing is the most advanced lesion itself. That's, that's the highest risk. Or if after you remove the lesion, you're not sharing your screen yet. Oh, I'm not, sorry. No. Nope. Sorry about that. Let me uh, correct that here. Okay. How about that? Perfect. Sorry. Okay, thanks for letting me know. But after lesion removal, what remains? Well, the, the patient remains, the rest of the colon remains. Matt just made the point about the field effect. So what is going on after we remove these lesions? Well, after high-risk adenoma removal, and I'm using this very broadly as a category of high-risk lesions. So let's not get stuck on the, on, the, on the specific nomenclature, but let's say after removing a high-risk lesion, you would accept a remaining high-risk for metachronous high-risk adenoma. If you say, these are polyformers, I need to follow you carefully. If I continue harvesting high-risk uh, precancers, I'm happy with that but you'd like to see a low risk of colorectal cancer. That's where we want to be. So keep this in mind as we look at some of the data. First, without lesion removal, what can we say about the lesion? And Cesare alluded to the older data that we have, for instance, from the MUTO studies, the larger the lesions, the more likely that they contain carcinoma, the more recent studies, including the meta-analyses by Sandra, would, would, would tend to support this view. Although bear in mind that some of these data are cross-sectional and others are what happens over time. And that's all potentially contaminated by the question of what did I miss the first time? Nonetheless, I think there's little argument that larger lesions are more worrisome. We don't have a lot of information on these lesions left in place. This is the old Stryker study, things followed over time. And after 20 years, patients with polyps that were at least a centimeter 24% of them had cancer, not all of them at the site of the initial polyp. So you have both the risk of the larger lesion and this possible field effect or what's in the left of the, in the rest of the colon. So size is important. We just went through the discussion about, about villus component in the MUTO data, villus adenomas had a 40% chance of including cancer. So those, those are the lesions or the lesions if you leave them in place. Now, what about after you remove the lesion? And, and all the data that Sandra showed is presumably reflective of this. People had things found, they were removed. We know that's not perfect, but things were removed. And then what happens later? 
what is the fate of the patient or the remaining colon? And one of the big issues here, of course, is the adequacy of resection. Bear that in mind. What do the numbers show? This is a meta-analysis that is in press in gastro. Uh, what Sandra showed has a few more recent studies, but, but the spirit of the results is about the same. These are patients with the definition of high-risk adenoma compared to patients with no adenoma. High-risk adenoma is 10 millimeters or more, villas or with high-grade dysplasia, or at least three. So multiplicity is included in this aggregation of the definition of high-risk adenoma. And compared to patients with no adenoma, the odds ratio of subsequent colorectal cancer incidence, almost three. I'm not showing it here, but the estimates for mortality are in the same range. So should this bother us? Is this bad or is this okay? What about the low-risk adenoma category? Here defined as one to two adenomas, less than 10 millimeters. These patients also are at statistically elevated risk compared to the no adenoma patients, 1.26. So they're not exactly the same risk. And again, this is presumably after these adenomas have been removed. So let's stop and think about this. Do the colorectal cancer incidence and mortality rates after HIA, HRA removal concern you? And, and recall, these are about threefold compared to the no adenoma patients. Do we have a problem? And if we have a problem, where? Is it in the screen? Is it in surveillance? Are we, are we missing an opportunity? Going back to what I presented before, after HRA removal, you accept the remaining high risk for metachronous HRA, especially if you say these are what Wendy Atkin used to call the patients with hot colons, but you'd like to see a low risk of colorectal cancer and for sure a low risk of colorectal cancer death. Matt and others co-authored this, this way of conceiving whether surveillance is working. The, the full-fledged chart in the publication has four different quadrants. The suggestion is that Possibly the best quadrant is one where your surveillance population has a high risk of advanced polyps in the future, it means it makes sense that you're looking at these people, you're finding the precancers, you're taking them out, but you should be achieving a low rate of cancer. That is the best prevention situation. But what I wanna ask is whether the types of results that Sandra showed, the results in the Duburi uh, meta-analysis put us in this quadrant. Are we in a situation where we are having a high advanced colorectal polyp yield in the future, but we're also having a high colorectal cancer yield, including interval cancers? If that's the case, then yes, this is a cohort that's at risk, but either the surveillance is ineffective or the quality of the prior colonoscopy was inadequate or the interval is too long, meaning it's not the ideal situation. So it really all comes down to, is the colorectal cancer yield high? Are the types of numbers that Sandra showed concerning? Or is the colorectal cancer risk lower to an acceptable level? And I think, I think Cesare zeroed in on something very important. The absolute numbers that Sandra showed maybe begin to make us a little less concerned because part of the issue here is when you're talking about relative numbers, it can be very confusing and potentially misleading. So, so bear that in mind as I try to do, do a thought experiment here. So, why is there such a risk of the removal of, of HRA? Can we ever get these patients to have the same risk as the normal colonoscopy patients? Or is that just not realistic? Is, is, is the field effect or whatever it is gonna win? What would have been the colorectal cancer risk without HRA removal? And then this is the surveillance session. What about without surveillance? And ultimately, are we succeeding in the screening and the surveillance or are we failing? Are those apparently high numbers evidence that we're failing? So I, I thought about a couple of ways to try to get into this. How, how can we estimate what the colorectal cancer risk might have been without removing these high-risk adenomas? And I'll show you a way of trying to back into it based on the prevalence of lesions, what might be the risk in the normal colon, what might be the estimated effect in low-risk adenoma. A lot of assumptions here, this is hard. Uh, I think Chesseter was proposing that maybe we could do research studies to, to try to get at this in a more sophisticated way. But this is just a totally made up thought experiment and I could have blown it. So please tell me if I made, made errors. And then I thought, well, maybe there's an easier way to do this. How about if we assume that the overall benefit of 
of screening surveillance is primarily the removal of the HRAs, then it's a little easier to make a calculation of, of how much benefit we're actually having. So at the risk of confusing you, uh, let, let me show you this way of thinking about it. Let's suppose that the population is made up of three groups, those who have a normal colon, those who have low risk adenoma, those who have a high risk adenoma. There, there's a certain representation of each of these on, on the population. And if we think about what their standardized incidence ratio is compared to the general population without screening, once you throw them all in and, and do a, a weighted sum of this, you should come out with a standardized incidence ratio of one because this is the total population. So can we back into this right lower quadrant box of what would have been the rate if the high-risk adenoma had not been removed? So I tried to approach it this way. These are not all the studies that, that have addressed this question, but we know that there are multiple studies showing that a normal colonoscopy predicts lower risk compared to the unscreened population. This is not affecting natural history. We're not doing anything. We're just identifying people who at that colonoscopy had no neoplasia, and they seem to be at lower risk. I assumed it would be around 0 0.4 compared to the general population. Now you can quibble with the numbers, but, but just go with me for the method here. So those patients go, go in. Now I put in some numbers that I thought might be representative. Let's say that about 5% of the population has high risk lesions, 35% have low risk adenoma. I know the numbers are higher with high detectors, but let's, let's just use this for illustration. And let's say about 60% of the population are normal. So, so the curve in the top left are just the proportions in the population. Most people are normal or almost normal. Uh, maybe a third of the people have low risk adenomas and small number of people in the general population have high risk adenomas. If you look down at the bottom curve, the relative risk of the people with a normal colon compared to the general population, we said is 0.4. I don't think we really know the risk for the low risk adenoma people. I kind of made this up, but I gave it a, a little higher than one. And so if we accept this, then what do we calculate for the box in the bottom right? What would have been the risk, the standardized incidence ratio with high risk adenoma not removed? And I ran several simulations and it comes out to be around six. This is a way of trying to back into this. Now realize that six is compared to this one for the general population. And, and that one is ideally a population that is general risk without screening, right? So you have to compare to a non-screening population. You can't be already contaminated by your effective screening. So I have no idea whether this is informative. Is it, is it likely to be true? Is it not? A couple of reality checks. So first of all, what fraction of colorectal cancers would come from, from this type of, of risk and proportion? Uh, I was a little surprised when I calculated these out. I'm not sure if this is true. It, it, it would come out that in normals, we are getting 24% of all the colorectal cancers. The low risk adenoma patients are generating about 45% of the cancers. That's a little surprising. And the high risk adenoma patients would be generating 31% of all the cancers. So I don't know if this calculation should tell me that this is fundamentally wrong or if this is giving us some insight. I don't know, and I'd be interested in, in your comments. So now, what we showed before was the comparison compared to the general population of one. What about if we compare now to the normals? Because a lot of the data that Sandra showed in the, in the Duvuri paper, they were compared to the normal colonoscopy patients. So here, look at this. The the ratio compared to the no adenoma patients, if that six estimate is right, brings us to about a 15 fold, 15 fold rate compared to normal for the HRA patients if we have not removed the lesion and about three fold for the low risk adenoma patients. Okay, so let's concentrate on this one. If this whole thought experiment has any merit, the high risk adenoma expected cancer rate without removing the high risk adenoma would be about 15 times that in patients with normal colons. So back to the, the Duvuri numbers, it was about threefold. If it would have been 15 fold without the high risk adenoma patients, then maybe we don't have such an enormous problem. And this, this apparently remaining high risk of subsequent cancer is really substantially reduced. So I have no idea if I did this right or not, but bear this in mind as we talk about the potential impact of surveillance. 
Maybe an easier way to think about it, if colorectal cancer prevention results largely from removing the high-risk adenomas, that's a big if. There's a lot of debate about what we're achieving with removing the low-risk adenomas. But if that's the case, then the overall observed reduction in incidence would be less than the effect in the HRA patients, right? Because we're not doing much with, much with a no, no neoplasia patients and maybe not much of an effect from the low-risk adenoma patients. And so then the standardized incidence ratio without removal of the of the high-risk adenomas would be the following. If we're achieving prevention of about half the cancers, then it would have been more than double with, without removal of the HRA compared to removal. And if we're preventing about two thirds of all the cancers, then it would have been three times as bad if we hadn't removed the HRAs. So another way to say, maybe those numbers, twofold, threefold, that Sandra showed, that the Duvuri paper shows, maybe those are not as alarming as they initially seem. So what does surveillance achieve? And the last talk began to get at this. What, what is the rate compared to the general population? That's the standardized incidence ratio. What's the comparison compared to the no adenoma group where the no adenoma group is low risk? And maybe the answer uh, as Cesare was honing in is what are the absolute risks? If we can calculate those, those are probably the most important. Is there a problem with the initial screen? Are we missing things? Um, and note that there's accumulating data here that interval cancer seem to happen early. So either we're missing something or they're aggressive. The, the, the risk many years out after a normal colonoscopy is actually quite low. So I think the, the cancers have fallen out for the most part early on. Is the apparent decrease in the standardized incidence ratio with subsequent surveillance in the data that I'm going to show you because the colorectal cancers are falling out or are we achieving something with surveillance? And here I need to understand the analysis methods better myself. This is a busy slide. I, I don't expect you to look at it in detail. It's just to say that in the papers that made it into the Duvuri meta-analysis, the last column shows that there was a substantial degree of surveillance. So that's not purely the risk of what happens later. It's also surveillance, but some of these cancers have found that surveillance. So I can't totally tease out what's the, the prevention attributed to surveillance versus what surveillance is finding. Now, there is some information in several publications from the UK cohort. One important paper here, first author was Wendy Atkin. We see here the results of first, second, or third surveillance. This is not a randomized controlled trial, but these are the patients who happen to get surveillance. And these are patients who had one or two adenomas uh, greater than or equal to 10 millimeters or three to four smaller ones. And you can see that the hazards ratio for future colorectal cancer compared to no surveillance, 0.57 after one, 0.51 after two, 0.54 after greater than or equal to three. Subsequent analyses, uh, first author, Amanda Cross for this one. I'm showing you just a bit of the data here. The, the group considered high risk. This was multiplicity, five or more adenomas or three adenomas with at least one bigger one. After baseline, before the first surveillance, 1.91 standardized incidence ratio compared to the general England population 2007. So that comparator is important. This is higher than the general population. After first surveillance, 1.34. After second surveillance, 0.91. So by this point, it starts to look like the general population. Um, I'm not sure whether we can credit surveillance or is it that the cancers fell out? So I'd like some help in the discussion thinking about this. Now, there's a high-risk subgroup within the high-risk group. And these are people with suboptimal exams, with high-grade dysplasia, or proximal lesions. And here, after baseline, the SIR355, after surveillance 1, 1.97, after surveillance 2, similar to the general England population. So if we step back again and say, these are the main reasons the post-colonoscopy colorectal cancers might happen, is there a big elephant in the room? How much are we still leaving on the table? And with that in mind, I, I, I was actually a, a little sad to see this, this recent paper that came out and looked at incomplete polyp resection. This was associated with sesalcerated adenoma in the orange, but still adenomas in the blue in the first set of bars. Also location, proximal, more than distal, and not related to endoscopist experience. And these were the incomplete resection rates by endoscopies. Now, if you think this looks familiar, it does. Heiko Paul had the same thing in 2013. So here we have the same issue side by side 
eight years later, this is kind of sad and it's a call to action. Now, this, this picture was selected for publication, but this is one where there is no visible residual. So are we, are we missing residual at the edges? There are now data on treating the edges or are, or are there times where it's not really this good? This, this is really chosen to show what was done. So for discussion, these are the things I'd like to open up. What do the elevated colorectal cancer incidence and mortality risks after HRA removal mean? What's the comparator? Is it the general population? Is it the patients with no adenoma? And is the apparent elevation a true elevation? Can we do better at colonoscopy? Can we do better at resection? And this applies to both the initial screen and surveillance. Do we accept reduction of col colorectal cancer mortality as opposed to prevention as the primary goal of surveillance in high-risk patients? Or are we really doing okay in terms of prevention? And, and we really need to think in a little more subtle way about the apparent elevation in these odds ratios. And finally, the main hope for this session is to promote research ideas, proposals, and I open it up now for, for your comments and questions um, and ideas about data sets, populations, resources, collaborations. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Yuri. That's very interesting and very, very amazing presentation uh, with a lot of open questions. We have a question from the audience. It's from Harry Major from the Netherlands. Uh, are there other factors that may predict pentaclonus colorectal cancer risk better than colonoscopy data? For example, polygenic risk scores or uh, exposure to, to several uh, uh, differences in, in, in microbiota. Shouldn't we take this more into account? Uh, thanks, Herod. So I can give my answer and then the other panelists can. Uh, conceptually, yes. I mean, I'm in favor of, of anything that, that allows for better risk stratification. Um, so I'm optimistic, but, but I'm, I'm also a little unsure whether the promise is going to be fulfilled. I think it's going to be hard. I think prediction is hard. And so whether we can actually get good enough prediction or not, I don't know. But if prediction with these other things is better than just a colonoscopy, then yes, I think we should think about incorporating it. What do the others think? Rodrigo. Cesare. Can I congratulate with uh, Uri? He's becoming more and more clever year after year. I mean, the first part of the, of the talk, Uri, was really, really uh, surprising and um, really now. I, if I understood that correctly, you calculated uh, the risk of colon cancer that is to be attributed uh, to high risk uh, a lesion, and this is about 30%. The importance of this 30% is that is related with a very low prevalence of lesion. I mean, most of the colon cancer risk may be found in a high risk lesion. This is why they are important. For instance, you also show that low risk adenoma have a attributable risk of cancer of 24%. But uh, low risk adenoma are a lot. So high risk adenoma patients remain the best target for screening and surveillance. This is why we need to put our effort uh, over it. Can you confirm that I, I got it right? That 30% uh, of cancer risk uh, with low recession is uh, in, uh, in high risk lesion. Well, I made this up, okay? So I mean, what, what, what falls out of here is, so first this red number is a function of what's in these, oh in these cells. So we should, we should play around with this more, okay? I think uh, a more formal approach to try to get this estimate is, is very interesting to me because I have no idea whether this number is right. And as you said, the proportions here matter. So then this 6.2 comes out from what I assume for these others. Maybe it's right and maybe it's not. But if you, if you say, okay, these first two rows are not crazy, then the total cancer numbers are here at the bottom. And I'm not sure if this is correct or not, because this would say that a lot of the cancers uh, over time come from the, from the low-risk adenomas. Now, some low-risk adenomas will become high-risk adenomas. We don't know how many. So you know, I, I, I would not hang my hat on the absolute numbers here. But, but as a thinking aid, as a way to try to get forward, this may have some merit. We just need to fill out this table 
in a much more rigorous way. This is just a, a very back of the envelope. Yeah, Uri, my point here, and then I leave to Rocky. Hello, Rocky. So happy to see you. Is that this slide show that anyway, high risk adenoma is something that matter. So I can agree with Rodrigo that we need to decrease surveillance in high risk adenoma. But Rodrigo, we must be careful because anyway, most of the cancer risk arise from this lesion. So we need to be extremely over cautious when we reduce uh, the benefit we give uh, uh, to this patient. Then I, I leave to Rocky. Okay, a uh, couple thoughts. First of all, great talks and great, great comments. Uh, from my view, I'm not surprised that the high risk adenoma people retain their risk over time, even despite surveillance. First of all, they're not all getting appropriate surveillance. And uh, I think there is something to the field effect. They've already declared themselves as someone who can manifest a high risk polyp. We know that the colorectal cancer people are the highest risk for getting another intraluminal colorectal cancer and not necessarily in the same place where the original cancer was. So that principle seems to play out biologically. The second point I wanna make is I'm not surprised that more of the cancers emanate from normals and low risk people, because there are a hell of a lot more people in those categories. And so there's no surprise that those are where the cancers come from. But the, the point to make uh, that Cesare made, and I think it's worth emphasizing, or, or perhaps Uri made it, this normal person may have evolved a high risk adenoma and then to a cancer. We don't know what happened, we just, Originally, they were normal, and then they had cancer, and we don't really know what transpired in between. So they certainly may have segued through this high-risk uh, category. Just as a final comment, um, I have, uh, you know, uh, the EPOS has many aspects to a study. One is looking at high-risk adenoma going from three years to five years, and one is the low-risk adenoma. And you know, in the United States, we're close to launching a randomized trial looking at low-risk adenoma. I was never so comfortable to test high-risk adenoma because it's only a small percentage of people and we know they're higher risk. And what are we really gain pushing them from three years to five years? I always had some misgivings uh, about that. Now, of course, we'll learn from the EPOS trial and I think that's great. So I'll stop there. That, that, that's, that's, that's a good point. Um, one, one of the, of the uh, advantage we will obtain with EPOS trial is to know more about uh, surveillance and the benefit of surveillance. Probably, uh, as, as, as we can see also in the, in the meta-analysis uh, Sandra has shown, um, we can split the high-risk category between the not so high risk and the really high risk. Um, um, and probably that will be our, our next step. It is clear as, as Yuri have shown that there is a high risk people and these high, high risk people must be surveilled adequately. <clears throat> and also there, it looks like the risk is higher in the first, in the first years after the baseline colonoscopy that, that Talks uh, in in favor of uh, of of the, the 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 role of the quality of colonoscopy. So there are a lot of questions we have to to answer, and and Ipostyle for sure will will help to and, and also your the your your the American trial will help to 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 answer these questions. Uri, uh, can, can I read Iris's comment here? So Iris Lundstrom Vogelar. I agree that absolute risk should be the target. However, I wonder whether getting the level of risk to the general population is the appropriate comparator. We give the general population colonoscopy screening. So that would advocate that we consider that risk to be high enough to warrant further screening. Uh, I, an important concept, right? I mean, what are we doing for the general population? Should we calibrate to that? I, I think that's, that's an important consideration. What, what do the other panelists comment? I absolutely agree with, uh, 
with Iris. And this is very easy in Europe where we have FIT. So we can send a patient with high risk adenoma after the first negative surveillance to FIT. I never perform two consecutive surveillance colonoscopy negative in a high risk patient. I don't know, Rodrigo, what you do in Spain within the FIT program. Sorry, I was uh, reading the Q&A. Uh, so, so you have you... a patient with high-risk adenoma. You do the first uh, surveillance colonoscopy that is negative. What do you do next? Do you send back to FIT? Because as Iris suggested, probably... They are in in, in, in high-risk people, we do the next at five years. Okay. No, five years later. It's uh, too much. But um, Uri, I want to bring back the discussion uh, on what you um, show in your uh, slide. The risk in high-risk patient uh, may be either due to incomplete resection or to missed, okay? Now, I can miss a lesion in a high risk, in a low risk, in a negative. So it's an uh, ineludible risk of colonoscopy. What is unacceptable is that the additional risk is due to incomplete resection, because this is clearly a failure of the endoscopy. Now we know who a good endoscopy is for MISD, that is the one with ADR uh, pumping up 50%. But we cannot identify the endoscopy who is good uh, in um, uh, completing uh, the recession. As you said, it's not the experience. It's not whether it's board certified. It's not how many uh, polypectomy he did. So I feel that we are failing uh, in uh, quantifying the attributable risk to incomplete recession and in identifying endoscopies and the polyp related factor that can predict this risk and be, can be incorporated in our clinical practice. I think that's a very good point and it's a huge challenge. How do we ensure uh, complete resection? All the discussion of AI helping things, is that gonna help? Maybe, maybe not, I mean, visibly, Visible margins should be a no-no, right? I mean, the latest data on the larger polyps are that even when things look clean, if you cauterize the edges, you, you decrease your recurrence rate. Um, so I don't have an answer, but I think you've identified a very important area of emphasis, which should be not only detection, but complete removal. How do we move this forward? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not totally sure, but let's, let's think together. Um, Rodrigo, what do you think? I think uh, we're at time. Should we close the session and invite email suggestions on, on, on potential collaborative research to move forward? I, I'd like to propose that. If anybody has any ideas, please send them by email. I don't know exactly how to move this forward, but uh, I hope that this spurred some thought. And, and with that, I close my piece. Rodrigo, take it away. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this amazing discussion uh, that, that has been really interesting uh, with very hot points. So we have to finish, unfortunately, and uh, we will invite everyone to the main meeting on May the 20th for, for uh, more discussion on, this, on these topics. Thanks, everyone.